What's going on guys? Welcome back to Consuming Crime with Jen and Jules. It is Jules here and today we are going to be covering the confession tapes. This is the third episode that I'm covering on the podcast but it is season two, episode two and can be found on Netflix. This episode is called Joyride on Netflix but I decided to call it The Snowball of Nebraska. You guys will see why basically because the investigation is just snowball It's just a big snowball, and you'll understand in a moment. Before we get started, make sure you give us five stars wherever you are listening, and make sure to check out the Patreon. At the $5 official level, you'll have available five episodes ready to listen, including the Aaron Hernandez series, as well as two additional episodes each month. At the $7 all-access level, you'll have all of the previous benefits plus our regular content with no ads. And at the $12 VIP level, you'll have all of the previous benefits plus not only do you get to listen to me tell the story, you get to watch me tell the story. Without further ado guys, let's jump right into it. This episode starts off with a woman being interrogated and she is hysterically crying, she's not look happy, and it's her with three other officers. And it doesn't look like she has been arrested or anything it just looks like a random girl hysterical and she keeps saying i don't know who i was with that night i wasn't with anybody i don't know i don't know i don't know but hysterics the episode then jumps to wayne and Sharman stock saying that they were murdered in their home and they lived in a secluded farmhouse and it had been a brutal brutal murder one of the detectives saying that it was the most brutal murder he had ever seen and he even has nightmares to this day Wayne and Sharman were an older couple, and they had been killed in April of 2006 in Murdoch, Nebraska. For my VIP patrons, I will put their picture right here. They didn't talk a whole lot about the crime scene. They get uh, like a little bit, but not as much as I would have expected. One thing we do get is according to one of the officers, Wayne's head was destroyed. I had picked up later on that they were shot to death, and other than that, it doesn't seem like there was any blunt force trauma there wasn't like a beating of any sort it was essentially a shooting in the preview they're talking about how they went from two suspects to four suspects i think they even might have used the word snowball we have being interviewed earl shank s s c h e n k shank i'm just gonna call him earl officer earl he is a former case county investigator According to him, Murdoch was a small community and there were not a lot of officers, which meant that people could get away with some of their crimes. The Stock family had a farm business as well as a hay business, and it was safe to say that the family had money. However, the Stock's nephew, Matt, was not super happy at the amount of money that he was getting. He felt like it wasn't fair and he should get more money. As a matter of fact, the whole Stock family accounts that they would often get into it. The uncle and the nephew, Matt get into it meaning verbal arguments i don't think there was ever a physical altercation at least not that they mentioned now nick sampson is being interviewed this is matt's cousin he says matt was definitely the black sheep of the family but those two were very close he was a good guy um, however he was impulsive and he did have a bit of a temper but definitely not enough to kill anybody police called matt in to be interviewed and he seemed like a plain relatively simple guy In the interview, it seems fine. He's saying he's happy to help. He actually wanted to be an officer himself, so he just wanted to cooperate. Police are letting him know that it is a non-custodial interview, which means he is free to leave at any given time. He is not being held hostage. He's not arrested. But again, Matt says, I'm happy to help. Now we have Matt Livers in the interview, in the documentary. This is the guy that's in the confession tape. So, spoiler alert, he's not in prison right now. He says he did not realize at that point that he was even a suspect. I can see the the comment about the plainness being a little bit plain. No offense. Yeah, I just did that no offense makes an offensive comment thing, sorry. He says he has never had an issue with him and his aunt and his uncle, which that part we know is not true because his whole family says, no, they've definitely argued about money before. The officers are telling him, by the way, he's being interviewed by two officers, one of them being Officer Earl, who we spoke with earlier. They're saying, you made a mistake, you effed up, and now you gotta pay for it. Officers are telling him that. Like, this is really how they conduct interviews in Nebraska. They really need to have a sit down with their officers. Officer Earl tells him, I will hang you from the highest tree. So kind of like threatening him. If if you don't tell us the truth, this is gonna happen. Like, we already know what happened. If you already know what happened and you can already prove it, why am I here being questioned? 
we are now seven hours into this quote-unquote non-custodial interview where did you get the shotgun we already know the truth just repeating the same stuff over and over again and this is the part that honestly kind of surprised me because i know what to expect with confession tapes they're false confessions officers are speaking to them in a terrible threatening way and somebody confesses when they shouldn't but this guy seemed to crack quite easily and i i know that i said seven hours but at any point in seven hours wouldn't you ask for an attorney or say hey i'm not under arrest can i just leave but again i'm not in matt's brain i don't know what he's thinking the officer says you have a gun he says yes officer says you took the gun to your aunt and uncles he says right says you took it and you shot them matt says right officer says so tell me what happened next i don't remember officer says you fired a gun to shut her up he goes yes sir then i pulled the trigger and shot her she screamed more then i just put the gun to her face and blew it away he says he did the same thing to wayne so that shocked me because i mean i haven't heard any of the forensic evidence i haven't heard any anything else besides what i'm telling you guys right now and i'm like matt could have done it but he just the way he's talking sounds off I'll ask you guys to watch it as well and let me know what you guys think. Officer Earl is lying to this day though. He accounts asking, how do you feel? And Matt responding with, I feel like the world has been lifted off my shoulders. But when you go back to the tapes, Earl does ask, how do you feel? But Matt responds like, Shit. to this day, how can you account that what you said came out of somebody else's mouth and be that confident? This is an officer of the law. He's supposed to be protecting us and he's telling little white lies like this. Officer Earl, I don't know about you, but that is not it. He was also accounting that everything he said added up to the physical evidence found on the crime scene. Of course, everything he said matched with the evidence. You were feeding it to him. There's video of him feeding him what happened. That's misconduct. I don't care how you look at it. Then in the confession tape, Officer Earl says, you weren't alone that night, right? And matt says right and randomly randomly he says i was there with nick who is his cousin we're in the documentary interviewing jerry sousey i'm not sure if i pronounced that correctly i'm sorry if i did not he was a former attorney and i believe he was an attorney for matt and nick or one, just one of them he says that the tapes were just not right it was like training a puppy first officers had to convince him of what happened that night and that he was by himself that was the first scenario and then they start bringing up another person the reason that they did this is because the blood splatter analysis determined that there was a second person in the room when one of them was shot i believe the way they determine this in blood splatter analysis is let's say i'm in a room and i shoot someone this way and their blood splatters this way Oh, I forgot I'm an audio podcast. Okay, if I shoot someone towards the bed, then behind me, there's going to be blood splatter away from the bed. And they probably determined that there was somebody standing behind there because there must have been a gap about the shape of a person between the blood splatter. Nick says he was at work. He was working at a bar in the kitchen at the time. One of his coworkers came up to him and said that there were officers waiting outside for him. He figured, okay, no big deal, like... I'll go out there in a second and he just continued about his work next thing you know about six officers walk in and arrest him on the bar floor saying you are under arrest for the murder of Wayne and Sharman stock the only thing he knew at this point was that Matt had given his name and said that he was involved somehow now we're taking a look at the interrogation tapes this is an interrogation the other one was also an interrogation, but they called it a non-custodial interview, which is dumb. They had him take a polygraph test, and they told him that the polygraph failed. He had failed the polygraph. And he was like, yeah, right, that's BS. And then he got an attorney. So he handled it a lot differently than his cousin Matt, which is good. Thank you, Nick. So this was Jerry, the man that we mentioned earlier. Hey, hey, uh-uh, you can't do that right now. That's a big no-no. Absolutely not, that is your loudest toy. Here, go outside. Look. Jerry needed to make sure that Matt did not testify against his client. He was confident that there was no evidence that linked either of them to the crime. We have being interviewed in the documentary now a man by the name of David Kofod. He is a former Douglas County CSI director. He believes you should not pay attention to confession tapes if there is nothing to back them up. He wants to see forensics and some other sort of link. So far, I like this guy. 
we agree on this. David was considered the most prominent CSI guy in Nebraska, and he was even named Mr. Nebraska. But I think the naming of Mr. Nebraska came from a bodybuilding competition because the images that they present in the documentary are him younger and I, when I looked up from my notes, I was like, whoa, like I didn't think it was the same guy. He definitely, I don't wanna say he did not age well, but I will say young him versus him now is the different. It's a different, like, I was trying to think of a joke, but I'm on the spot and I'm being recorded, so I can't. <laughs> He's a different man, obviously. I intended on posting pictures of the difference because I thought it was so interesting, but I later in the episode come to not liking this man, so let's just continue and forget that he was ever good looking. This was a middle of the night shooting, and a letter carrier, a letter, the documentary says a letter carrier. I'm just gonna call him a mailman. I know that they're slightly different. A mailman and his girlfriend had come and delivered some newspapers around this time. This mailman reported passing by the scene and seeing a car, a tan sedan. The reason he remembered is because he remembered when they took off that the car went up behind them and like zoomed past them really fast. And that's the only reason that they remember the specifics of the car. Officers took this immediately as the murderer's car how i don't know because it was parked in front of the house and it zoomed off i don't see the link here maybe you guys do matt does not have a tan sedan neither does nick but nick's brother has a tan car and now we have in the documentary being interviewed will sampson who is nick's brother aka the owner of this tan sedan he accounts that neither of them had been in his car for a long time the officers took his car, but he really wasn't worried about it. He knows that nothing happened in that car. They checked it thoroughly. They even did a luminol check and they could not find anything. So they gave it back to him. Fast forward, they took the car again. And this time they did find some of Wayne's blood around the driver's seat, like right under that steering wheel area. Which I wonder like, did they not do a thorough check the first time? And why check it twice unless you're gonna do something? This comes up later. Nick was facing two counts of felony murder and two counts of felony use of a firearm and the death penalty. I'm just gonna assume Matt was facing the same charges. They don't mention it though. There was also a ring found at the crime scene. We have being interviewed in the documentary a woman by the name of Mary Martino. She was a jeweler at the time of the murder and she was from Buffalo, New York. Officers were able to determine that this ring was custom made and it came from a and Jewelers, which is where she worked. It had Corey and Ryan engraved on it. So now officers needed information on who placed the order. Mary worked for the manufacturer, but it wasn't an actual store. So she had to go through files and files of every store that they manufactured, which was Walmart, Zales, and overall it took her about three days to find it. This ring was purchased and shipped to an address in Wisconsin whole nother state. Officers find Ryan, the man that purchased this ring, and he accounts that his car had been stolen and the ring was inside of it when it was stolen. Now we're back to the way Earl accounts things. He's saying the pickup was stolen by a couple, Jessica Reed, who was 17, and Gregory Fester, who was 19. The truck ended up in Louisiana. This meant they had passed Nebraska at some point. They ended up back in Wisconsin and got arrested for stealing this truck. Earl wanted to connect these two kids. They must have had something to do with it. Him and some other detective go to Wisconsin and interview them. This was five weeks after Matt's arrest. Lo and behold, when they find the pickup truck and they run it for DNA, they find Wayne's DNA all over the car. They had also found a flashlight and a marijuana pipe on Wayne's front yard, and the DNA on those two items did match the couple's DNA. During these interviews slash interrogations of the couple, Greg was not saying much and he really didn't seem like he was going to budge anytime soon. However, Jessica was a little bit easier to crack. Three men were interviewing her together. They at the same time were searching her house and they did come across some incriminating things. They found a cigarette carton with a shell of a 12 gauge shotgun similar to the one that was used in the killing. They also found a note like, a, like in her diary where she wrote, we killed some people, I loved it. So she literally confessed to the crime on paper. This little brat, okay, she's in the interview. She's saying, can we skip through some questions? I have stuff to do at 12.30, my Nana's coming over and this, this, this and that. And so they ask her, can we have an hour of your time? And she's like, oh, I guess. 
According to her, they went into the house, took $500, and left. Mind you, at this point, they don't know that they're also at her house and what they found there. Officers say the two people in the home were murdered that night. After the officer says that, she loses her mind. She's saying, how could those two people have died that night? We don't know anything. We didn't do anything. Like, just hysterical about the whole thing. Like, how coincidentally are you there that night that they are murdered. The two other people come in and do it? Earl is still saying that these two alone does not make sense. He's saying because it's so random, these two had to have known people that knew Wayne and Sherman. Which you guys, random killings and random house invasions happen all the time. You don't need somebody to show you the house you're gonna invade, you just do it. It's obvious at this point that Officer Earl does not wanna admit that he's wrong that's this is this is a pride this is a pissing match and this is when everything just really really starts to snowball more than it already has they start showing her pictures of matt and nick she's saying i've never even seen that guy in my life i've never seen him i don't know who that is just sticking to her story at one point the officer tells her this is how you get the electric chair and the gas chamber tell us what happened you're literally threatening somebody to get a confession that doesn't exist. She eventually says, I do remember meeting this guy. The officer says, you meet him in the parking lot of this bar, right? And she says, yes. She says, this guy is scary. If he did it, put him in jail. Officer Earl in the interview today is saying, Jessica told us I met this guy at the bar. No, she didn't. We just watched a tape of you saying, you met this guy at a bar, right? And somebody saying, right. That's not the same thing as her saying, I met this guy at a bar. Earl is just a garbage person. His logic is that Nick and Matt want to shoot their aunt and uncle, and they found these two people from out of state. They said, oh, perfect. Let's add them to the loop. Let's go kill them. Jessica says, we met up with these guys. We took the money. They shot somebody. I took the money, and then I heard bang, bang, and then we left. And now she's hysterical again, crying, saying, why did we have to meet them? I wish I never met these two, yada, yada. We're getting a voice recording of Jessica and it sounds like it's from prison. She says, I don't even know. I just went with it. I just picked people. I guess I picked out Nick, but it didn't feel right. So I'm like, what are you talking about? Back to 2006, where she says, two days after the interview, she admits she does not know those two men. It was just those two there. The officers immediately started walking out. They're like, you're lying, you're done. And they told her to shut up. And she was like, are you kidding me? Like, I don't know these two guys. I, basically, she feels guilty for lying. The officers are not hearing it. The documentary is now interviewing a woman named Julie Bear. She was Matt Liver's defense attorney at the time. She was working at home late at night and she's watching these tapes. This was before the trial. The tape that she picked out was called Liver's 2. In this tape, they see Matt, or we can see Matt, and he's wearing orange, so he had already been arrested. And he says to the officer, I was never on the scene. I don't know if Nick is the actual person involved in this. I was just making things up to satisfy you guys. So he's essentially recanting his statement. And the officer in the tape is not happy about it. He's saying, you're lying. What's done is done. Again, not hearing it, similar to the way they acted with Jessica. It had been six months, and she was barely seeing this footage now. There was still the question, though, of why was Wayne's blood in the car? Matt's defense attorney was convinced that it was planted, and he suspected it was either Earl, the other lead detective, or David Kofod. This is the part where I said, hey, I don't like this guy later on. We are now in a courtroom with Kofod and a judge. There is a charge being brought in for tampering with evidence. And you guys, guess what? They're asking him today in the interview basically what happened. Did you tamper with the evidence? And David Kofod is like stuttering really hard. Don't get me wrong, I stutter all the time. You can hear me in the episode sometimes because I don't feel like editing it out. But for someone who was so composed earlier in the episode, why are you nervous, dude? He says he did not plant evidence, but maybe somebody else did. Regardless of what he has to say today, he was found guilty of tampering with evidence. He ended up serving two years for this. Attorney Jerry is saying that he doesn't think that David Kofod would ever tamper with evidence to put somebody innocent in prison, even though that's what he did. He's saying that he must have been so convinced of their guilt that he just needed one small piece to get them in, which regardless, you shouldn't need that. Nine months after Matt's arrest, charges are dismissed. 
this is weird because again they're only talking about one of them but it's obvious that nick was also released because he's being interviewed now greg and jessica were sentenced two life sentences each and they both pleaded guilty nick went back to murdoch but matt could not come back because at that point the village their village like the city is what they call it and his family had believed the rumors which is that he did have something to do with it even though he didn't Stop it. he is not normally this annoying that's a lie yes he is <laughs> Matt and Nick filed lawsuits against investigators and David Kofo for violating their civil rights. Matt got $1.65 million from the state and the county. Good for you. Nick got $965,000. To this day, Earl is still mad. He's still pissy. His pride is harmed. He's saying, this is not fair. He wasn't lying. He looked right at me. Like, okay, because somebody can't lie just because they're looking you in the eye. Like, whatever. Dude, shut the hell up. <laughs> And uh, I guess Matt works as a security officer in Texas now. That's pretty much it for today. I want to know what you guys think. I'm, I'm definitely curious as to why somebody that had nothing to do with something would confess just to get somebody off their back. Like, you should know better. Just because you lie and say, okay, yeah, fine, I did it, doesn't mean they're going to say, oh, okay, cool, you can go home now. Like, you're okay with the consequences of potentially going to prison just because you want a cop to what, shut up? If you're on my VIP... Uh, you can see this, I'm showing you the little thing that keeps bothering me. Can you apologize to everybody? Because, apologize to future Jules, because she has to edit out all of your ruckus. Anyway, that's it for today, guys. Make sure you give us five stars wherever you are listening. Make sure you check out the Patreon. At the $5 official level, you'll have available five episodes ready to listen, including the Aaron Hernandez series, as well as two additional episodes each month. At the $7 all-access level, You'll have all of the previous benefits, plus our regular content with no ads. And at the $12 VIP level, you'll have all of the previous benefits, plus not only do you get to listen to me tell the story, you get to watch me tell the story. Sorry, he's trying to escape. Thank you for consuming crime with me today. You will hear me next week.